Hello, all, and welcome to Bennis Stories, a series of interviews with people who knew, loved, were influenced by, worked with, wrote with, were students and mentees of Warren Bennis. This is Kate Bennis, Warren's daughter. This series is created for the Warren Bennis Leadership Institute at the University of Cincinnati's Lindner College of Business. My partner in this endeavor is Betsy Myers. Betsy was a dear friend and colleague of Dad's and worked with him at the Center for Public Leadership at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government as its executive director. She has also been a senior advisor both to um, President Clinton and President Obama and is a senior advisor to the Warren Bennis Leadership Institute. Today, Betsy and I are delighted to welcome Noel Tishy. Noel co-authored a book with Dad, Judgment, How Winning Leaders Make Great Calls. Noel is a professor of management and organizations at the Ross School of Business at the University of Michigan. He was head of GE's Leadership Center, the favored, fabled Crotonville. He served for nine years on the Columbia University Business School faculty. His most recent book is Succession, Mastering the Make or Break Process of Leadership Transition. He's also written Judgment on the Front Line, How Smart Companies Win by Trusting People, Judgment, How Winning Leaders Make Great Calls with Warren Bennis. The Ethical Challenge, How to Lead with Unyielding Integrity. The Cycle of Leadership, How Great Leaders Teach Their Companies to Win. The Leadership Engine, How Winning Companies Build Leaders at Every Level. Noel was named one of the top 10 business books in 1997 by Business Week. He is a co-author of Every Business is a Growth Business. He's also co-author of Control Your Destiny or Somebody Else Will. How Jack Welch is Making General Electric the World's Most Competitive company. And Noel was named one of the top 10 management gurus by Business Week and Business 2.0. Please welcome Noel Tishy. Noel, thank you so much for joining us. I, I was senior year at Colgate University, psych major, and the great Warren Bennis was starting a doctoral program. He was starting this incredibly innovative program at SUNY Buffalo. I was a psych major, wanted to go into applied behavioral science stuff. I ended up going to a Columbia with Morton Deutsch. Your dad was part of that network too. That was an MIT crowd. There were a bunch of networks that connected way back that kept bumping into each other. Well-known applied behavioral science type people that were part of that gang. Yeah. Yeah. I was a senior at Colgate. What did I know? I was probably one of the few 22 year olds coming right out of college. Yeah. A lot, a lot of people were older. Did you actually interview with dad at that time? Yeah, 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 yeah. Told me don't bother applying. <laughs> at the interview, he said that? Yeah. It was a long, it was a long, painful drive back to Hamilton, New York. That's a long yeah. drive up to New York. Who's on that? Who's on the cover of that book? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so tell us about and, the book. And notice I got the first author on it. <laughs> you did. You got yeah. first billing. We had a discussion of that. I have a copy of the article on your book, Judgment, an article in the Wall Street Journal on November 29th, 2007. And he had the top billing on that. You must have just said, okay, I'll get on the book. You get on the Wall Street Journal. It wasn't that logical. Come on. (laughs) You you must have me mistaken for somebody else. (laughs) I don't know how it happened. We had just a, a fabulous both friendship and collegial relationship. For me, it started long before I met him in person, when I was a senior at Colgate, studying the field, a psychology major. Bennis, Benny, and Chin book was was my dream to go be in that doctoral program. So tell me about what was it in you that led you in this direction of personal development and social psychology? What was it in you? Probably being adopted. I, I was I was very lucky to be adopted by my par- parents in Meriden, Connecticut. They had been trying to have kids, and they, they kept had miscarriages. And my aunt lived in Port Allegheny, Pennsylvania, which is south of Buffalo. And she delivered all her kids in Buffalo. So her doctor said, hey, we got one coming along. <laughs> my older sister, two years older, was adopted. And it was my aunt who found her. I was born December 31st, 1945. I think they were out there a few days after I was born, you know, a snowstorm, of course, (laughs) and drove me back 350 miles to Meriden. That was the beginning of my journey. I was was blessed to be adopted by a mother who was third grade school teacher. My dad was a a local banker in the Meriden Savings Bank. 
very involved with the church, very involved in the community. So I grew up in an incredible household, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, choir, good stuff. And then there was a side of me, it's probably related to being adopted, where I would act out, or sneak out at night. <laughs> I learned how to drive a car. because We had some property in a dirt road that my dad taught me when I was 10 or 11, and I could drive out there. And so I remember I had a morning paper route, and I was like 12 or 13. And the morning paper, papers came at 5.30 in the morning, and this is a rural area. So I had 35 customers with a four-mile bike ride. Oh. So wouldn't it be cool if I could drive the car and deliver the paper? So I would occasionally sneak the car out, deliver the papers, get it back in. And then I got really ambitious. They used to play bridge every Friday night. And I said, okay, it's 7.30. They won't be bound until 10.30. We're going to do some joyriding in the neighborhood. One of my dad's hats, sit on a boat cushion to make myself bigger. And I would drive around. And I remember taking the car out right after they left. And it's dark out. I'm driving down the road. Coming the other way, it's still dark, but I could recognize that was my parents' car. So I pull into one of the neighbor's driveways, turn the lights off, and I see him go up, turn around, I see him slowly drive down, went by, I quickly drive up, put the car in the garage, garage was a separate building, and then I go hide in a bush behind the garage, it's all dark. <clears throat> My dad is no dummy, he went right to the garage, opened the hood, put his hand in, and the engine was warm. You talk about a punishment for a 16-year-old, driver's license were... Uh, available in Connecticut at 16. You are not going to get your driver's license at 16. I was in a tough blue-collar community, Meriden, Connecticut, not to have your driver's license. Luckily, I went to prep school starting in my sophomore year. Can't have a car, you don't need a car. So I avoided being embarrassed in high school by going off to prep school. Is that what led you to psychology and social psychology? Learning about yourself and no, it was, no, I got a good, I got a good grade in in psych in my <laughs> freshman year at Colgate. I know what I wanted. It looks interesting. I had a good grade. Luckily, I was a good student, and I was a cross country runner and track runner. But I was also acting out a lot. I totaled a couple cars, so this is kind of good boy, bad boy stuff. So another serendipitous thing happened. One of my buddies at the fraternity said, "Hey, look at this." NYU has a program called Junior Year in New York, like Junior Year in Europe. We don't need a car. We can take subways around. So it actually changed the trajectory of my life and career because I moved to New York, got an apartment on East 75th Street, one of those railroad apartments with a couple other guys. Happened to get a job at Bankers Trust Company that summer. My dad was a president of a savings bank. Amsterdam Savings Bank, but he was a correspondent bank with Bankers Trust Company. And so I got a job at Bankers Trust Company in their personnel department. Well, it just so happened they were implementing a new program called the Blake and Mouton Managerial Grid, which was instrumented sensitivity training. They have this grid, you want to become a 9-9 manager. You focus on people and you focus on tasks and you need to do both. But they were also revamping all of the pay systems. So they had to all do all the job descriptions. Fabulous way to learn. I'm running around the bank interviewing head of trust operations and branch operations. What are the jobs here? What do they do? And so I learned all about personnel and organization development. Talk about turning lemons into lemonade. That is so interesting. Doing interviews, you learn so much, right? You can just be a student, have a reason to be curious. That really sounds like it was a, a pivotal that moment. Yeah, because that, that also changed the trajectory of where I ended up. Because one of the faculty members from Columbia happened to be working with Bankers Trust Company, and I met him. I really wanted to go to your father's PhD program, but I ended up getting into Columbia, because this was 1968, Vietnam War. Half my fraternity brothers were going off to Vietnam. Others were going to Canada. Others were going to the Peace Corps. No easy choice. I was absolutely not anti-military, anti that war. Hmm. So I got into the PhD program at Columbia thinking maybe I'd get an, a, a student deferment. 
they said for doctoral students, <laughs> no, no deferments. And that was the year they came out with the uh, lottery. And I was like 110 out of 300 and whatever. I said, that's not a good number. The other serendipitous thing is any student who didn't have ROTC in their undergrads university could join ROTC as graduate students. So I joined ROTC as a doctoral student. This would have been 1968. And that meant you had to do eight weeks of basic training, Fort Benning, Georgia, then classes twice a week in uniform. Columbia had thrown ROTC off campus. So I had to go to NYU all the way downtown on the subway in a uniform. Mm. You put a trench coat over that. <laughs> so, and, and now, in 1968, like, going to the village in uniform. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, you, yeah. and you don't take it off till you get in the building. Yeah. <laughs> and wow. That was, there's an anti-war demonstration at Columbia campus. Then there's one at NYU. And it, it, it was crazy. And then the first summer I did Fort Benning, Georgia, basic training, eight weeks. There were about 40 of us in our platoon. I would get the New York Times delivered to me in the U.S. mail. So they had to deliver it to me. Well, if you were in the Army in those days, that was a pinko commie newspaper, anti-war. You know, and so you're out on bivouac, this is Georgia in the summer. Your pack has no room. They don't have ad trash cans. What are you going to do with the New York Times? You got to stuff it in your pants and march it in 95 degree weather with the New York Times. That was basic training. And then the next summer was advanced infantry training in Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. And then when it came close to accepting my commission, I realized that my number was pretty high. And I said, I'm out. I'll take my chances. Luckily, my number was like 200 and everyone 100 and below got drafted. Wow. So you may find it strange that I run a whole thing for veterans. I work with uh, West Point. I work with It was never, ever anti-military. It was that war. And what is so I, I, I do a lot with veterans now. Do you think that living through the Vietnam War was something that made you think a lot about leadership? I was actually really interested in sensitivity training in T-groups. Because I, I ended up going to Bethel, Maine a couple of times, doing the advanced behavioral science program. That was a graduate student. It was the Bankers Trust Company. Oh, okay. They had been working with some people that were tied into NTL, and I heard about it. So when I do workshops, I do what I call journey lines, the ups and downs of your life. Most of the important things for a lot of people happen serendipitously. It's what you do with those serendipitous times. You either capitalize on them or you go downhill. I turned a lot of these lemons into lemonades. Yeah. Is I mean, that really, something you can teach, Noel? Oh, absolutely. Oh, How I, do you teach that? Well, when I do a workshop, I don't care whether it's with executives, military people, uh, high school kids, flip chart on the wall. One axis is smiley face, sad face. Bottom is birth, death. Draw the ups and downs of your life. And then make some notes, what was going on in the ups, what was going down in the down. And then pair up with someone in the room you don't know and get their journey line, take good notes, because we're going to have you introduce that person. I'm going to introduce Kate, and she was born here, and this is what happened here. And her boyfriend broke up with her here, and she did this and that. And then and she was in Girl Scouts and whatever. I do this around the world because it's, it's not culturally specific. I've done this in China, India, mm -hmm. Russia, Brazil. Everyone has a journey line. And so it's a great way to break through cultural boundaries, too. So what do you think it is about seeing that and telling those stories and being seen and witnessed by somebody else who then tells your story? What do you think about that teaches people to make lemonade out of lemons? Oh, it's, it's, it's one piece of it, which is self-understanding. And the other thing you learn is, and we, we tend to do this intuitively. I mean, think of the times you've sat next to some stranger on an airplane or a bus, and you end up getting their life story. People like telling their life stories. 
And they tell you some pretty personal stuff. Leaders lead through stories, which has been written about. And there are three leadership stories, the who am I story, the who we are story, identity, and the where are we going story. And so when I work with organizations, we start with the who, who am I story, and we worry about the who we are story. And then we do exercises like I, I mock up a Fortune or Business Week cover. And then you're going to write the story you want written about you five years from now. And it's a narrative. It's not an outline. What do you want written? What did we miss? Him getting in trouble in sixth grade, being an honor roll, then getting rejected. Everyone's got a different trick. But, and I don't care whether I'm doing this with Navy SEALs, which I've done it with, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, United Way, executives. Everyone's got a journey line. And inevitably, people have worked together for 30 years. I didn't know that about you. Now I understand. Yeah. Yeah. No, when you're talking about all the kinds of groups that you work with, what I'm amazed about is the diversity and the age diversity and the experience diversity. Do you feel like anybody can be taught leadership? And do you think this is something that should be in all institutions? Of course. course. Come on, I was a Cub Scout and a boy. We had leaders in Cub Scouts. We had leaders in Boy Scouts. I was a camp counselor, 15 and camp counselor, 16, 17. I'm taking 14 year old kids on 100 mile racket river trips with one other 17 year old, and they got to paddle 15 miles, but they love you at the end. Called tough love. We did it. Who were your mentors? Who were the people that you really saw as great leaders and great examples and great mentors? I mean, Warren falls in that camp. I mean, we didn't spend as much time as I would have liked to, but they, it was very important to his writings and meetings. I went to Mount Hermon, which was a wonderful experience. Now, if we go to prep school, even though my dad was a banker, the local banker, my mom had to go back to teach third grade to help pay for it. And the reason I went to Mount Hermon, again, I think Sarah, I met the cross-country and track coach, and I was running cross-country track. I like the guy. I'm going to go there. But it was wonderful because Northfield and Mount Hermon were Dwight L. Moody's birthplace in the late 1800s is mostly kids whose parents were ministers or school teachers. This was not Exeter and Andover. This is Mount Hermon. And he had 20 hours of work a week, either the kitchen or the farm. A marvelous culture. And I, again, I lucked out. I ran track and cross country there. One of my teammates was Frank Shorter, who won the Olympics. Uh, wow. we, had, we were undefeated, New England champions every year. I was probably number five on the team, whatever. But we would we would clean against Andover, Exeter, show everybody. We'd just wipe wow. them out. So that was another important thing, being a long-distance runner. Wow. Because you don't give up. You run through the pain. That comment about track, my daughter ran track for a while, and I was really taken with the kids. Most of them were good students. They were good kids because they had to learn how to run through the pain, do what they didn't want to do, discipline. There was something about kids who run track. Oh, absolutely. Some people just born with a natural ability. I did not have that, but I had the willingness to run through the pain. When did you then reconnect with dad? You remember what precipitated the book, Judgment? What brought you guys together to write Judgment? He was a rock star in the field. Well, it all goes back to Kurt Lewin. Mm. You know, you go back in social psychology, all this stuff goes to the 30s and 40s. And and so anyone who wanted to be kind of an applied behavioral scientist, it all goes back to those roots. The other lucky thing is when I went to Columbia, there was also a long tradition of sociology there. So I got to work with Robert Merton and some of the world-class sociologists because the social psych, Morton Deutsch, had strong relationships across campus. Yeah. So I lucked out going to Columbia in the social psych program. So I I was in the right in that milieu. I arrived Columbia campus 68. I left Colgate. All the buildings were being held by the students. I started my PhD program in right after graduating. from. I got a job in the social psych program for the summer before we started classes. 
Mark Rudd was still holding the campus with all their pictures of the Columbia campus with all the students hanging out of the windows. And so. so my first research project in social psych was to interview students, faculty, community members on the impact of the Columbia uprising. So for six months, I'm walking around with a tape recorder. I probably interviewed about 100 people. And it was a great way to enter that milieu. So again, as another example of, I don't know where your parachute is going to land, but that one was fantastic. You know, what's interesting, Noel, is that in two significant experiences that you cite, you were interviewing people. One was at that summer job at the bank. Yeah. One was yeah. at the campus that you gave yourself this opportunity to really get curious and listen to other people and learn from them. What did you end up doing your dissertation on? Change agents. Ah. <laughs> and change agents were defined as individuals who purposely were trying to change the social system. So I had radical anarchists in New York who were blowing up buildings. I got to interview them. Wow. I had Ralph Nader's, Nader's Raiders. I had organization development people, but I had the craziest right wing Minutemen. And I, I had to meet them up in the woods in Connecticut because they were worried the feds were. I mean, it was, I, I, these were the most incredible interviews. But if you do it right, most people want to tell their story, whether they're Minutemen or Navy SEALs or whatever. And somehow they trusted me. I had tape recorded all these. Some of them are really know. fascinating. Oh my interviews. God. That's amazing. And the way I do, I do that to this day. Look, I want to tape record this. If at any point you want to tell me something you don't want recorded, we'll turn it off. Nobody ever turned it off. Did you ever think when you were doing those interviews that you might want to switch to journalism? No. <laughs> Why? Because I had the same yeah. thought. Yeah. No, I, I no, because I'm a social scientist. Yeah. I'm a so social psychologist. Yeah. What do you think we need now from leadership development and leadership training? More attention to what I call global citizenship, environmental issues, land, water, air, biodiversity, human capital issues, housing, education, healthcare, jobs, which is it? All the above. Oh, my God. Yeah, order. That is it. I, I, I want to bottle exactly what you said. And what is the best way to train people to do that, to care about those things? Get them, get them involved. Most young people, if you get them involved in the right way, I mean, I work with the boys and girls clubs, too, the YMCAs. I take 14-year-olds out. You can get them to do their journey lines. You can get them to think about giving back. You can get them on a track. It, it's not a single thing. It's probably some of my Sunday school, some of my camp counselor stuff all coming together. Most people don't connect all the dots and do something with it. But if you help them, you know, I've seen many people where I've been able to influence their trajectory. Gee, gee, I never thought about that. I didn't really want to go to medical school. My dad's a doctor and he wanted me to go to medical school. Good. Why don't you come to the social psych program? Opening people up to, to getting in touch with who they are and what makes sense for them. That's their authenticity, right? So helping exactly. people step into their authenticity. Precisely. And you were talking about how in the social psych department at Columbia, they were divided, right? There were two different departments. Wow. One was the roots of Leon Fessinger, an ad hoc group. And then Morton Deutsch was actually housed in Teachers College. And we had Charles Kadushin, a sociologist. Morton Deutsch was always involved in civil rights. His dissertation was on integration of black housing at Harvard and back in the 40s. Wow. And who changed their attitudes and who didn't. And so he was always working civil rights and anti-war issues his whole career. And what I think what I was driving at is that it sounds to me like you're about experiential learning, like actually putting people in a situation where they have to do something as opposed to theorizing. I call it, I call it action learning. I've done a lot of work in the health area. So I work with residents. I ran a health clinic in Hazard, Kentucky for a year. I don't know if I told you that. No. Oh, wow. wow. I was, <laughs> it was funny. When I went to Columbia, we had some joint degree students in the MBA program who were MD students getting an MBA too. And we had MSW MBAs, MBA, MPH MBAs, and some medical students 
Columbia Presbyterian in New York I was working with. And one of my former classmates at Colgate went to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, which funds a lot of healthcare stuff. He knew I was doing stuff in healthcare. He said, you know, we have this project we're funding in Hazard, Kentucky, with the Appalachian Regional Hospital System. They're having trouble. They're not going to be able to sustain themselves because we funded them to be able to do outreach and in-home care. That is not reimbursable. They will go bankrupt at some point. We've got to somehow motivate people from the hollers to come into the clinic or they don't get reimbursed. So again, another serendipitous thing happened is a buddy of mine from Colgate, Tom Maloney, was at the Commonwealth Foundation, said, look, we're funding some of this down there. Why don't you go down there for a year? Okay. So I moved to Hazard, Kentucky. I don't know if you know where Hazard, Kentucky. This is oh. Eastern Kentucky, two hours from Lexington, up in the hills. You could find pockets to this day of people still speaking Elizabethan English. Wow. I was in a clinic. We had diseases that you can't find except in underdeveloped countries. And two other things going on then. They were still in the moonshine liquor. But you would drive up in the hollers and we had you'd be in an official vehicle with a nurse practitioner and a social worker to do prenatal, postnatal care. Somebody would be there with a shotgun aimed at you because they think the feds are coming after my still. And then the other sad thing is they went from stills to marijuana. Now they're into crack. It is sad. There's there's literally 20 million people in that Appalachian, all the way to New York State, all the way down through Georgia. And you look at the health and economic statistics for those people, it's awful. And it's generation after generation. I mean, there were genetic diseases you can't find any other place in the United States. Wow. You, you go into these one-room shacks up in the hollers, and the whole family is sleeping in two double beds. Event, working in the South Bronx of New York, doing this stuff globally. Yeah. We aren't, we aren't even close. We got so far to go. Mm, we do. The University of Cincinnati, which is housing the Warren Bennis Leadership Institute, is yep. is it the first co-op university? Which means that all of these kids, the kids are remarkable. These are kids who have been working jobs every summer and throughout yeah. college and are leaving college with jobs. Yeah, money in their bank accounts. Talk about experiential learning and learning by doing. It's remarkable. One of my daughters went to Oberlin, which mm-hmm. is a terrific experience. Professor has a PhD and a professor uh, of psychology, <laughs> of course. <laughs> All of my daughter, three daughters, none of them became capitalists. <laughs> Social worker, the VA, teacher, environmentalist. Growing up, I took them all over the world. China, India, Russia, Brazil, had all these projects. And we wouldn't just go as tourists. We'd go, you know, we'd go visit hospitals, schools, uh, get into the culture. And so it had a tremendous impact on how they grew up. It had nothing to do with what they learned in class. Experiential, right? My parents did another interesting thing. My sister and I, she's two years older. She must have been fifth or sixth grade. I was third or fourth grade. And they took us out of school early for a six-week trip around the United States in a station wagon and a tent. Northern route, southern route, camping the whole time. Wow. I can still remember that. I can still remember the first time I saw Old Faithful. I can still remember the Grand Canyon, Tom Sawyer's house. We're doing it with all our grandkids now taking them on trips, not just to go to the movies or theater, but to see cultural things and have some fun. No parents allowed. Grandkids and us. No middle management. (laughs) (laughs) Because you know what happened. They don't whine with me. They have fun. We got 14 grandkids. And we've taken taken some of them to uh, Japan, Mexico, Europe. Because one of the biggest gifts we can give them is opening up. And we don't go there and just party. We go to the museums, steeped in some of the history. It's me as the camp counselor. I was teaching five-year-old kids how to try and get in the canoe and do stuff. That's the fun part. I'm really curious about your work on judgment, how you came to that topic, the the work you've done in judgment and integrity. Um, Those two things, which were also very important to Warren. 
So judgment's a neat word because judges make judgments, priests make judgments, ministers make, we all make judgments. And there was just very little literature on judgment. And so there was a huge literature on decision-making. So Warren and I started talking about it. We said, yeah, judgment's the right word. I'm just curious, when we think about the curriculum for Warren, the teaching of, of judgment and integrity, we were talking about, can we teach judgment? Yes, you guys say we can, but some people just have incredibly bad judgment. We all know people in our life who just make bad decisions. Those issues that you're such a master in of integrity and judgment, how do we teach that? Yeah, I do this with Boys and Girls Club kids, with the YMCA, with Navy SEALs, with executives. And there are three judgments that matter in life. People, strategy, crisis. People, who's on your team, off your team. Strategy, what mountain do we climb? How are you going to handle it? That's life. If you don't have strong values, you get bounced all around. If you don't have a teachable point of view on the ideas of how the place works, you're going to get bounced around. And if you don't have some point of view on how you motivate people, you're going to get bounced around. So you kind of build a framework that says that's the foundation for being able to make judgments. Most people have no clue <laughs> why they make the decision they make. What do you think we need from leaders in America today? What are the qualities that you think they lack and that they need? Very strong grounding in who they are, value system, how to be a leader teacher. Great leaders are great teachers. Moses, Jesus Christ, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther. Come on, think about the leaders who made a difference. Churchill, he was a teacher. Roosevelt, go back and look at the leaders that made a difference. They also enlighten people and, and bring the people to a different level. They're not dictators. Jack Welch, when I was at GE, was an incredible teacher. Really? He had a PhD huh. in chemical engineering. He was a kid who grew up in Salem, Massachusetts, with a stutter in a working class committee. What happens to a kid with a stutter in grade school? They make fun of him. That was Jack. But Jack was another incredible character, working class kid, Salem Masters, with a stutter, captain of his hockey team in high school. Wow. What does captain of a hockey team mean in Salem, Massachusetts? Far more than football or basketball. Oh, yeah, definitely. He's been butchered lately in the press about the way he managed. That's been going on. I can find Neutron Jack stories. This guy was in class every week at Crotonville, dialoguing with people. At the end of every session, people would write him a personal note to Jack from Noel, and you have to put your email. My biggest takeaway from this session, how I'm going to apply these learnings and a question I have that it didn't get answered. Wow. Jack would get a hundred of these. I would sit down and we'd go through every single one. He would make personal notes on them and we'd hand them back to the individuals. Wow. Every other week. People don't know the real. No, they and don't. I introduced him to Susie Wetlaufer, his wife. Her, um, editor of Harvard Business Review. Yeah. So I knew her from that. And but Noel, do you remember he was at Warren's event in 2006? He came yeah. to the dinner. He didn't come to the day long when you did the panel on judgment. He came to the dinner with Susie. I was doing an event with Jack at the University of Michigan, I think. And Susie was H editor, editor of HBR. I think he had just come out with his book and I'm doing a book event for him. And I, I said, Susie, what are you going to do about it? I said, we didn't get an advanced copy, so we're not going to review it. I said, that's Jack Walt. Come out to Michigan and interview him. And I have the HBR interview she did with him. And, and let him talk about the book. But don't miss an opportunity. Two weeks later, I get a call from Jack. Jack, you're going to get a call from Business Week or Fortune about my relationship with Susie. What about your relationship? And then I used to visit them up in Massachusetts. And, and we hung out. And every time we, they, we love you so much. Thank you. You introduced us. Our lives haven't been the same. Oh, oh that's awesome. So I was the matchmaker there. Because I've been doing this all over the world with all kinds of people, 
I have all kinds of workbooks, all kinds of materials. I know how to do oh. multimedia stuff, and I will help you create the most incredible oh. kind of material. Thank oh you God. so much, What's Noel. Talk about? Come on. So we, we, we what am I going to do? Gonna do? Retire and play golf? Thank you so much, Noel. I know. Thank you. Nice I'm on call. Love okay. working with you. Thank, thank you. Thank you.